I'm just going to go out and introduce okay. it. Do you want like a, do you want to do for like five or ten minutes? Or are you? Yeah, I think they can do it together. Oh, you guys got it? Fantastic. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Richard Lawson. I'm the chief critic at Vanity Fair. Um, thank you all for coming to see this wonderful film tonight. Uh, I'm so happy to be here with you all and to welcome Flea's filmmaker, Jonas Poer Rasmussen. Jonas, thank you. <laughs> Jonas, I don't know how many people in the audience are aware, but you just won, Flea just won uh, Best Nonfiction Film at the New York Film Critics Circle this morning, which was very exciting. <laughs> Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I was there in that room, and it was, I, I was rooting for it, and I'm glad it, it, it won in the end. Um, I, I first saw this film uh, at a virtual Sundance uh, almost a year ago, and I think for me the most initially striking thing and the, the biggest question I had was, I mean, this character, or, I mean, this person in this film is someone you've known for a long time, still know, and he had this story that he had never spoken about before, really. So I'm curious if you could tell us about what the conversations were between the two of you about getting him to agree to sit down and, 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 and be recorded, telling that this, you know, this whole history that he had never really shared before. Um, it wasn't really a conversation we had. You know, I, I met him in when I was 15 years old, um, and he arrived to my sleepy Danish hometown uh, all by himself and stayed in foster care with a family just around the corner from where I lived uh, and he came all by himself from Afghanistan and I was of course curious about how and why he got there uh, and I asked him but he just didn't want to talk about it and being a 15 year old boy you're like okay and then you just kind of move on and hang out and, and, and then our friendship grew and, and it was, was just not something we talked about, you know, as it said in the film, there were there were rumors going around uh, in high school, um, but he himself didn't want to talk about it. And then, you know, I started wanting to do stories, tell stories. Um, I have a background in radio, and about 15 years ago, I asked him if I could do a radio documentary about his his story, and he said uh, he said that he knew that he would have to do it at some point, but he didn't feel ready yet. But when he was ready, he would like to share his story with me. So I kind of, from from that time, I had it in the back of my head that this was something we could, we could do together. And then um, eight years ago, I was invited for this workshop in Denmark called AniDocs, where they combine animators and documentary filmmakers to develop ideas for animated documentaries. And they asked me if I had an idea, and I thought, okay, but maybe this is this is a good way to, to tell the story. Uh, and I met up with Amin and asked him if he wanted to share his story, and then we, we'd we could do it as an animated documentary. And he finally said yes. And he was very intrigued by the fact that we would do it as an animation because then he could be anonymous behind it. Uh, because his big concern was, you know, he, he didn't want to be victimized. Um, and the fact that this story, what you see in the film, what you hear is his real voice telling the story for the very first time. And it's not easy for him to talk about. Uh, so the fact that he could avoid being in the public eye and, and still keep control over when he wanted to share things and not ha having to meet people in the street who w would have seen the film and wouldn't ask him questions about what happened. You know, this is not something he can small talk about. So that was really what enabled him to say, okay, but yeah, I feel ready to share my story. Uh, he really felt a need to connect his past and his present. Um, and the fact that he could stay anonymous was kind of key for him to open up. So th those, those interview sessions, I mean, how long of a period of time did this happen over? I mean, you know, we see toward the beginning of the film that he kind of is like, oh, you know, actually I'm not quite ready to talk about that. Like, w were there a lot of those kind of stops and starts? Or once he got going, was it kind of just, you know, it all flowed out of him? No, there, there were quite a few stops and starts. And also, you know, because these were things he hadn't talked about for more than 20 years. So things he, he had forgotten. And slowly, as he kind of dived into the memories, he would start to recollecting things that he had o otherwise forgotten. Uh, so it was a slow process of, I think I did between 15 and 20 interviews during the span of three or four years with him. And in the beginning, it was really the broad strokes and then slowly we would go deeper and deeper into his story. Um, and sometimes I would listen to an interview and I, new questions would pop up and I would ask him, can we revisit this, in th this memory? Uh, and then we would go even deeper. So it was 
a slow process where he kind of became more and more ready to share his story. Um, yeah. So, so much of the film is him narrating, um, and, but we also get these wonderful human moments that I think really, you know, we're hearing this terrifying, you know, childhood that he had, but also then I seeing him in adulthood doing such quotidian things as looking to buy a house and there's a cat and, you know, uh, what were the, when did you decide that you also wanted to take recording equipment when they were looking at real estate and it was having couples conversations? I mean, was that always part of the idea of the piece or did that kind of, how did that emerge? I started recording him and his boyfriend from the very beginning of the project. Um, I didn't know what I was looking for in the beginning, but just thought, okay, I, 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 I was looking for how can you see that he's still affected by his past? So I was kind of starting out, okay, what's going on in his life? And just followed hi him around uh, when he worked and when he was with his boyfriend. And you know, with documentary, sometimes it's just lucky accidents or, or like, um, you know, being a refugee is really uh, someone who lost their home uh, and is out looking for a new place. And and when I started recording him and his boyfriend, they were looking for a, a home. And I thought quite quite fast, I thought, okay, but this is something I need to follow because it kind of supports uh, his story of being a refugee. Um, so I was, I, I just kind of became lucky with that story. Uh, but I, I followed him around for, for, for quite a bit in the beginning, just whatever he did. Did you watch anything change in him? I mean, this is someone you'd known for a long time, but here he was finally and really on the record telling this this origin story that he had. Like, did you did he? Do you think you saw him evolve or grow during that period? Yes, definitely. And and I think he knew that he would as well. Uh, at the very first interview I did with him, uh, he told me that he actually didn't care if the film was going to be made or not in the end uh, for him just the fact of sharing his story and getting it out there uh, would help him. Uh, because, you know, keeping secrets, you always keep people at a certain distance because you're afraid of getting exposed. So just the fact of getting the story out there and, and, and also being able to bring your past with, with you was important to him. And, and, and he told me so afterwards that he felt more calm uh, because now he could talk about things that he otherwise tried to keep a secret. So you could have charged therapist rates and made a, 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 a good amount of money on this. Um, I'm glad you didn't. But um, so the other, I mean, the, the you know, you mentioned the animation, um, which is so beautiful, and I think that it obviously, s I mean, it serves multiple purposes. One is to keep his identity secret, but also um, I you weren't there filming this stuff when he was on these boats and you know in Russia, and and I I think they really approximate childhood memory, you know, because they're kind of fantastical, but small at the same time um what was the uh, i know that the animation was an early germ for this idea but like can you tell me a little bit about the evolution of it and how you decided to not just animate him talking to you but then go into the sort of illustrating this the story he was telling but that came really early as well uh, you know when you when you do documentaries about things that happened in the past it's always kind of a struggle to figure out okay how do i make this feel current how do I, how do i make the past come alive again and and pretty early we kind of thought okay but these stories that he was giving me in the testimony we need to 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 feel them we need to see them before in, in front of our our eyes um so really making Afghanistan in the 80s come back alive and his childhood home, and also the fact that we could place him in there, you know, we could, we could animate him in and place him there, um, so we could really experience what he experienced, uh, was, was there from the very beginning. And, and then a bit later on came, you know, the fact that we would use the animation as a more kind of expressive element at times, because when he starts to talk about things that were really hard for him to talk about, his traumas, um, then the testimony kind of changed and you could hear in his voice that he, he spoke slower and, and sometimes he just kind of stopped. Um, and I thought, okay, but all of a sudden, this is not about what things look like or what, what actually happened. Now it's, it's an emotion and, and we need to see that emotion. And with the animation, it really enabled us to be very, very expressive about you know, diving into his inner emotions uh, that we couldn't have done w with a camera. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wrote about it in my... Uh uh, top 10 movies of 2021 list and, and about how the term animated documentary seems kind of funny because you're like, well, animation is something you create and a documentary is supposed to be real life. But somehow the animation in this, it brings the truth closer 
to the audience, I think. And um, yeah, I, have you found, uh, you know, the film premiered almost a year ago. What has the truth of the film evolved into? I mean, like, how does Amin feel about it now that it's screening all over the world and winning awards? I mean, have you, have you guys had a kind of running dialogue about like where Flea has, has taken his story? Um, yeah, we, we talk about it a lot, and I think um, he's very happy that he's still anonymous. You know, he he's in the house. Uh, he ended up in in, in the film uh, and takes care of the plants and the cats, and and he's he really enjoys that he doesn't need to be a part of the journey because it's a lot. It's overwhelming uh, for him and for me. Um, but he's very happy that people relate to his story, that this kind of story is out there. Um, I think he and me feel that the refugee story is kind of, they're often mainly just described by what they need and not by, um, you know, not as being the complex psychological creatures we all are. Um, so because this story, this is a refugee story told from the inside of a friendship, uh, both he and I hope that we could give a bit of nuance and give a human face to the refugee story. So it's a very important project for both of us. You know, the, the, this film, uh, at least at its onset, is about events that happened 30 or so years ago. But now we have another, uh, well, I mean, the crisis really never ended, but a new chapter in the crisis in Afghanistan um, with the reemergence of the Taliban. And um, ha has that, in those recent events, have they given you any sort of hesitancy or, or, or new kind of understanding of, of this film as it exists? Because it's a movie about someone talking about the past, but it's really relevant to the present. H how do you kind of consider the film I in regard to contemporary, you know, what's happening in Afghanistan right now? But you know, it, it just became sadly relevant, and I, I would have hoped it, it didn't. Um, it's been heartbreaking to see what, what, what happened and how history repeated itself. And of course, during this film, for working on this film for eight years, I, I, have, I, I feel quite close ties with Afghanistan. And, and, and I worked, there's this sequence in the film where I'm in Flees, Kabul. Um, and I worked on that for weeks and months. And to all of a sudden see almost identical shots on the news was heartbreaking. But you know, even more so, just being in touch with them in. And he was very affected by the whole situation and, and reminded about um, you know, his own journey and seeing a new generation of Afghans getting pushed out of the country and being in the same limbo he was in. Um, and he has family down there still and it's, it's a really bad situation. So it's, it's just heartbreaking to see you know, a country being in the middle of a war they're not really a part of and, and, and getting squished in that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, among the many things the film does is remind us that this was not a new story in the early, late 80s. It's not a new story in 2001 or now. It's This is an ongoing thing. And, and I think your film uh, really speaks to that continuity quite quite beautifully. Um, so enough of me. Uh, we do have the opportunity for some audience questions. I think there might be a mic available. Oh, perfect. Um, does anyone have a question? Oh, right there. Hand. Hi, um, my name is Aisha. I'm, I'm from Pakistan, so naturally Afghanistan is very close to my heart. and. It almost felt surreal as I sat here and saw this and let a mean story break my heart. But again, like it's been winning awards, so I don't want to go into like the praise and everything. Um, the question that came up for me while I was watching this was, um, in the process of making this, did you or perhaps I mean on the team, did anyone at any point feel like the story needed to be adjusted in any way to perhaps fit? a more global or Western audience or to make it more palatable um, at any point? Um, no, actually it, it was quite, um, I wouldn't say straightforward, but it, it, it really, you know, it comes from the friendship and, 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 you know, it did change in the process of making the film. Like I started 2013 uh, and in the beginning it was very much me wanting to make a film about my friend who had a secret. Um, and then the refugee crisis hit Europe in 2015, and all of a sudden you had a lot of refu like Syrian refugees in the highways of, of Denmark and and the rest of Europe. And I felt the need to, um, you know, give refugees a human face, as I said before. Um, 
And then, you know, later on, I also started thinking about my own background. I'm not a refugee myself, but my grandmother was born a refugee. So it, it, it became more and more personal, and, and the pers perspective kind of changed a couple of times. But it was really from what happened around me and, and inside of me. I see a question here. Uh, thank you so much for, the, for making this film. It's very, um, it's, it's extremely moving. Um, uh, I can, you know, I, I, there's a lot of things to be said about how it speaks to people in different parts of the world. I'm from Africa, so, um, you know, it, it speaks to me in a different way vis-a-vis -vis LGBT rights. Um, my question is uh, actually more of a, perhaps a narrative question. The, I mean, I think people would maybe, um, I'm curious, of course this is an, a nonfiction film, but it also has a narrative, a very strong narrative, and I'm very curious about um, uh, the question of reality. Maybe this is a bit philosophical, but how you construct the reality um, because the person telling the story is uh, has a narrative of their own, but as a filmmaker, you're also trying to build a narrative. Um, so that's one, but also there's a moment at which I notice your filmmaking reveals certain things. Um, for example, what is considered a lie. Um, and so I, want, I wonder if you could address that notion and how the two things begin to meet each other, your story and his, his story as he's telling it. It's, it's, it's always a, an interesting uh, discussion about when is something true and when is it not. Um, I think with this one, um, it is of course a I mean subjective story as, as seen through my lens. And if someone else had experienced the same things I mean had and someone else would make a film about that, then the, the story would be different. Um, but, um, and sometimes, you know, uh, saying something is true is like, how do you grasp that? Um, because as soon as you turn on the camera, uh, you'd point it in a certain direction. And then you as a filmmaker make a decision to point it in that direction. And then is that true or not? So it's always seen through some lens. So I, I really like to say that this is a very, th this is an, an honest story. I try to be as honest as possible. Um, and really uh, pay homage to the testimony Amin gave me. And of course, Amin has been a big part of the process of making the film. Uh, I, I did, you know, I, I transcribed all the interviews I did, and it did a kind of document, um, um, because his story takes place during more than 30 years, so there's, there's a bunch of stories in there, and I had to find my path through it. Um, and he read that. Uh, and gave comments on it and, and said if I had left things out that he felt was really crucial to understand his story, um, and then we'd have conversations about it. And the same thing went for the, for the edit. He would see that and, and the same process. Um, so it was really a collaboration between him and me. And I feel, and he feels this is an honest story, an honest representation of his, his journey. Um, if it's true, that's a big question. I can't answer that. Um, I think we have time for one more question, if anyone has one. Uh, oh, I see a hand. Hi, I enjoyed it too. Thank you so much. And it bounces off the previous questioner and your previous answer, but the two timelines were very clear and sort of, um, well, they were clear and the narrative, the different narratives, his, his different explanations of what happened became I would, you know, for me, deliberately confusing, and then it resolved itself, and it resolved itself very organically, and even in many instances with your question, she would ask him a specific question that was in my head, and he would answer it, and that would resolve itself. My question is, was the structure very organic, or did you really have to spend a great deal of time on how to structure it and where to place the resolutions of the confusion of what actually happened? Um, it was quite organic, but you know, it, it, we had a lot of material and it was, um, I spent a lot of time like finding the path, as I said, there's so much material, there's like 30 years of lived life uh, in there, so to try to find a path through that, um, um, we needed to do a lot of work and, and, and figuring out, okay, but what, what stories that he told me in the testimony would support uh, the story that we wanted to have in there, which was the fact 
I really wanted to be very clear on what a refugee is, and it's someone looking for a home, someone who's lost their home looking for a new place to go home. So that was that became the center of everything, and what it, what it means to not have a home. So um, it was really we, I found that core of the film, and then trying to work around it and make make sure that that everything in the film kind of supported that. Well, thank you all for your questions and for being here. Jonas, thank you. Uh, please go tell your friends to come see Flea wherever it's playing. Uh, and we wish you luck with everything else. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.